and throw it in with this molecule, this thing's susceptible to a nucleophilic attack. The one guaranteed nucleophile you have with the protein is the amine group on the end. Morning. Is the amine group on the end. See that lone pair there? Can come over and do an attack there in the pouring leaves. This, by the way, as I've said a couple times, is an aromatic nucleophilic attack. Most of the times when y'all played with aromatic rings in organic, they were aromatic electrophilic attacks. Okay? When you all did the nitrations and did the things with Frito Crafts and all that stuff, it, those were electrophilic reactions with the aromatic ring. This is one of your two, few chances in nature to do a nucleophilic attack. Aren't you all thrilled, especially since it's a Thursday, <laughs> that you got to see a nucleophilic attack? No, huh? not really. All right. The fluorine leaves, and what you end up doing is sticking all of this onto the end. Now, one of the things to point out, okay, could we have done the attack with this nitrogen? The answer is no. Why not? Because that's an amine. That's not an amine group anymore. Okay? And what, I pointed this out the other day, what about that lone pair? What's it busy doing? Giving this bond partial double bond character, right? So it's not free to go play around and do nucleophilic attacks. Okay? You're in a peptide bond there. So the only amine group that can do this reaction is the one on the end. Pretty much. Pretty much. Okay? All right. So we end up with this thing. Now, if I treat this with water, with H plus and water, I'm going to do the same thing I just did over there. I'm going, I'm going to attack every single one of the carbonyls in the amide groups and cleave them all. So I will accomplish chopping the thing completely down to the individual amino acids just like I did here. But with one difference, the terminal guy, the terminal amino acid is not going to just get chopped off like this. The terminal guy is going to get chopped off looking like this. Now, number two, number three, number four, all the other ones are going to end up looking just like they did over here, okay? But number one is going to have this big thing hanging on to its end. Now, that looks very different from that, right? Agree? We all agree? We all agree, right? I'm not going any further until we all agree. Okay. All right. Now, which means this is going, and it's got this big nonpolar piece of shit hanging off the end. So this thing is going to travel very differently in a chromatogram. So there's two ways we can identify it. We can look and see which one of the which one of our peaks in our chromatogram disappears because the ter the terminal guy is not going to be moving the rest of them. The other thing is it's going to be moving over here somewhere all by itself. And it turns out all the different 20 amino acids move a little bit differently. If this, if this happens to be a glycine, it, it, uh, most chromatography systems, it's going to move differently from if it were an alanine, or if it were a tryptophan, or a glucamic acid, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they all are going to be a little bit different in their properties. And we could take all the different individual amino acids and do the reaction with them separate and make standards. So we can identify because we have standards, we can identify which amino acid is the terminal one. Okay? So, we have a way of telling what's number one. Well, that's something. That's better than no information. The problem is, we still have blown the thing completely apart. So, there's no way of telling what number two, number three, number four, and so on. Okay? But the first thing we can do, if I tell you that we've identified the N-terminus. Okay? This is how, we've, this is how it gets done. But still, we would like to be able to identify all the other amino acids. Now, the problem comes in here in that we, what we have done is 
we are using water as our nucleophile. And it's a small nucleophile and it can get in and attack all the carbon eels. So if we throw in any water with the acid, we blow the protein completely to hell. Okay? Sort of like put, dropping a nuclear bomb. Okay? Which is what they want to drop on the oil well. At least the Russians did. Um, but, okay, so here we go. Here's the best way, here's what we're finally going to do to get the sequence of the whole protein. We're going to come up with a way of labeling the end that does, and chopping the end off that does not involve water. And what we're going to use is a nice nasty molecule. This was invented by a guy named Sager, okay? Who also came up with one of the best ways of doing DNA sequencing. Okay, got the Nobel Prize somewhere along the line. Okay, this is phenylthioisocyanate or phenylisothiocyanate, one or the other. Okay, it's got this NCS, nice nasty looking mother. Okay, and here's what it does. also susceptible for a nucleophilic attack because it's got a carbonyl here. Okay? There is car carbonyl here. It looks, it's, except it's a thiocarbonyl. The CS double bond is like a CO double bond. Okay? So what happens here is he just couldn't take it anymore. The nitrogen comes along and attacks that carbon. Okay? We attack there, and temporarily what we make, don't you love organic mechanisms? What we end up making there is this thing. Somewhere along the lines of hydrogen is picked up. What does it matter? That's a test. We're not doing any transformations here. Okay, now, here's what we do next. So we've, we, squirt some of, we squirt some of our miracle reagent in here. It adds to the end amino group. That's the same as what we just did over there. Now here's where the difference comes in. Now what we do is we throw in HCl gas. And because it's in a gas form, we can make it anhydrous. Y'all know what the word anhydrous means? It means there's no water around. Okay. That's your new word for the day. Okay. Reading rainbow. Okay. Your new word for the day, anhydrous, means no water. Okay, so we've still got H pluses floating around. So what we end up doing with the eight with that is we protonate all the carbonyls. Now all the carbonyls get protonated. Okay? All the carbonyls do get protonated. Because H plus is really teeny tiny little sucker. It's as small as you can get. And still have caught like an atom, right? So the H plus goes buzzing around. And that means every single carbonyl in the molecule does get protonated. But there is no water around. So there's no nucleophile. Now this is like you just fed the molecule an aphrodisiac and give it nothing to play with, okay? So what's going to happen here is this, the species, this thing is now begging for something to do a nucleophilic attack. And the only thing you got that can do a nucleophilic attack here is, happens to be this sulfur right there. And the only ca carbonyl that sulfur is close to is the first one, is this one. It's not close to the one down there, okay? So, the sulfur comes along and goes, attacks there, does a nucleophilic attack, just like we were doing with the water, and that breaks that bond. When that pair of electrons goes out, it picks up a hydrogen. 